书。My name is Maria Vukdelic and I'm a lecturer at the School for Food Technology, Food Safety and Ecology at University of Donja Gorica in Montenegro. I'm sure that each and every one of you has at some point in your lives uh, visited some protected area, a national park, a nature monument, a reserve. But in this in, uh, explanatory video, I'm going to give you a brief overview or the brief history of the concept of protected areas. So the idea of um, setting certain piece of land aside for some kind of protection is actually quite old. Uh, we as humans have always lived in direct contact with nature and our survival depended on the nature's ability to provide us with the food, with fuel, with uh, fresh water, but also with spiritual connections, with a sense of place and belonging. So humans have always been setting pieces of land or for controlled resource use or for cultural reasons. Places like hunting grounds or sacred groves and such can be considered the first forms of protected areas. However, the protected areas that we, um, as we know them today, arise in the 19th century. So this is the period of industrial revolution that brought a really big shift in the way of life of people. People started abandoning rural areas, moving to towns to work in the factories, to work into, uh, uh, to live in the very confined and cramped spaces. So because of this, first of all, they lost this direct and intimate and everyday touch with nature, but they also started romanticizing nature as something that is beautiful, where their life used to be um, uh, nice and, and easy and not so um, confined to this very urban and inhumane conditions. So the, this first phase of protected area development uh, officially starts in 1872 with the establishment of the first national park, Yellowstone, in the United States of America. In the establishment charter of this park, it says that this is a public park or pleasuring ground for the benefit and enjoyment of people. Other countries followed this example and started establishing their own national parks, Canada, Australia, South Africa. And the common feature of this first, uh, these first protected areas or national parks was, first of all, that these were large areas of relatively pristine nature. So uh, big areas which were not spoiled by uh, new uh, urban development with the new roads and railroads and factories and the pollution that they brought. The aesthetics was the main criterion for establishing protected areas. If something was stunning and beautiful to look at, then it was um, deemed worthy to be a protected area. These were parks. So basically, these were recreational grounds where people were invited to come and visit and spend their leisure time. That's why the word park is becoming a part of this uh, protected area terminology, even, even in the present day. These protected areas were established by government, so this was a very top-down process. And because this was a period of nations building, so USA, Canada, Australia, and others were freeing themselves from colonial rule and establishing themselves as new free nations, the national parks were sort of a symbol of their newfound liberty, of their national pride. And that's also why the word national is becoming a part of the protected area terminology. The second phase of protected area development covers most of the 20th century. Here we also see this top-down process where the governments are establishing protected areas with no public participation whatsoever. Once again, the protected areas are established almost purely on the aesthetics or uh, grounds or maybe some others, some other, but not on ecological basis. The approach in managing protected areas is very nature-centric. So the protected areas are being managed to protect uh, usually large charismatic biodiversity, uh, megafauna, and the people that live in, an hour, uh, in or around the area are considered as pests. 
So this caused uh, many conflicts with local communities because there was no respect for their traditional use of land or resources. There were uh, restriction of access. There was no respect for property rights. And quite often the establishment of protected areas also implied the relocation of local and indigenous communities to other areas. So you can see that already from this kind of history, there are two things that are inherent in the protected area concept. First is visitation. They were initially established as park, and even nowadays they are uh, linked with tourism and visitation and recreation. And second is the conflict. So conflict uh, between nature, the need for protecting nature, and the needs of local population that are using this area. The second half of the 20th century is seeing a shift in, in the protected area paradigm. This is the period where the ecology is establishing itself as an independent scientific discipline. So through research conducted within the science of ecology, we are learning much more about uh, various ecological and evolutionary processes. So we understand much better things like population dynamics, community assemblage, disturbance, succession, etc. Also, from social sciences, we are having a much better understanding of resource use, of planning, of management. In this period, we are also seeing an unprecedented rise in the human population, uh, which also means that there is a rise in human needs and also an increased degradation of ecosystems and ecosystem services that nature provides. So with such an atmosphere, um, the ecological principles are becoming the most important uh, in the establishment and management of protected areas. So it's not it's sufficient anymore for something to be beautiful. It needs to have an ecological basis to be proclaimed the protected area. Also, the protected area um, approach is shifting from islands, so these are not viewed anymore as sort of pieces of land surrounded by border. The, uh, the, the shift in view is to, to, to see them as part of the networks, part of the network connected with other protected areas through various ecological corridors, but also part of the whole landscape or the whole mosaic of different land uses that surround it. People are also starting to be treated as an integral part of this ecosystem, and it has been recognized that even some kind of human uses are beneficial to biodiversity and biodiversity protection. Also, the stakeholders are becoming increasingly involved in planning and the management of protected areas, and there is an increased integration of the protection with the need for development. In the present day, protected areas are not anymore seen as some kind of a luxury that, uh, you know, uh, we have to have this beautiful landscape to just uh, go and relax. Uh, they are uh, not viewed as an economically unviable form of land use that doesn't produce any kind of income or opportunities for income. Uh, they are viewed as places which provide economic and social benefits for local communities and for nations uh, or regions, uh, primarily through tourism and also providing ecosystem services and through these activities or these opportunities providing um, the uh, possibilities for income generating or alternative ways of financing uh, local communities and national economies. So protected areas are increasingly managed not solely for the purposes of biodiversity conservation, although that is still the first and, and foremost um, reason why they are being established. So as I said, they are not they are presently managed not only for biodiversity protection, but for the purposes of local development. In the past 40 years, uh, the area under protection on the global level has increased from the size of the UK to the size of the South America. Currently, about 15% of Earth's surface and 7.3% of oceans is under some kind of protection. As you can see, this is really an unprecedented change in the deliberate form of land use, apart obviously from agriculture in human history. However, despite all these developments, uh, despite the increase in the uh, surface area under protected areas, they face many, many challenges. 
there is hardly ever uh, enough or sufficient financial resources to cover all the costs of protected area. And this does not only mean the uh, salaries for people working there or um, for conservation activities being carried out. This also means covering all kind of opportunity costs or the, the, the for uh, losing the opportunity for using that space by local stakeholders. Uh, managing the protected areas requires quite specific knowledge and uh, the protected area managing bodies are faced with human capacities in terms that uh, the people are not uh, trained well or don't have sufficient knowledge to properly manage protected areas. Sometimes the protected areas are not designed well. Their size and shape and the way the borders are being established maybe doesn't cover or doesn't allow the protection or the continuation of ecological or evolutionary processes that are happening in this area. As mentioned before, uh, conflict is inherent in the protected area concept, so there's almost almost always some kind of conflict between the protected area and their manage, managing body and the other resource or land users like uh, forestry, water um, sector, agriculture, tourism, energy, etc. Uh, there is quite often a low level of awareness of people, be, be it on the local or, or national or or a wider level uh, towards the nature, towards biodiversity, towards the need to protect it. People are not really aware of the benefits that we that we have from nature, and this also sometimes creates even negative attitudes toward protecting the nature. And also there are always some kind of trade-offs. Protected areas are uh, always having to, um, to, to weigh different options to uh, promote or do one thing at the detriment or loss of another. At the same time, we are seeing an increased a continuation in the increased pressure on natural resources and also all the global and national and regional policies of, of um, development are also sort of demanding the increase of surface under protection. So all of this puts an extra challenge on protected areas to be efficient, to uh, ensure the protection of nature on one side, but also to ensure meeting the, the needs uh, for development of local population or the nation. So how can biosphere reserves contribute to modern protected area concepts? Uh, biosphere reserves are sort of a special form of protected areas, and this is the concept that has been developed uh, by UNESCO, and it has evolved exactly in order to tackle this challenge of reconciling the conservation of biodiversity on one side with its sustainable use on the other. Biosphere reserves are a way to apply integrative management that takes into consideration both the nature and the people living in the area. As you can see, this is a very um, uh, challenging um, uh, approach, and that's why biosphere reserves have to uh, sort of be very innovative. They have to uh, search and apply for innovative so solutions. They have to have a, a multidisciplinary approach. They have to not only foster, but, but really um, develop collaboration between different actors, between different sectors, in order to overcome all these conflicts and challenges and achieve compatibility between people and the nature. In the rest of this course, you will hear much more about the biosphere reserves and we'll explore this concept in more detail. Here I, will, I thank you for your attention and I hope that this presentation has given you a good start for the reminder of this course. Thank you for your attention.